for doing this, Tiffany. Of course. Really sorry for the lateness. Here we are. Uh, you're good. Appreciate it. Everybody seeing this? I see your screen. It has the uh, kind of, there you go. Perfect. So it looks good. Perfect. So I'll start with a little introduction. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for being here. We're very fortunate today to be joined by uh, Dr. Tiffany Peng Hua, who is uh, an assistant professor of otolaryngology and neuroatology at Temple Health uh, with a research appointment at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, both in Philadelphia. Uh, Dr. Penghua completed her residency at New York Presbyterian Hospital of Columbia in Cornell in 2019, where I was actually her junior resident. Uh, we were co-residents together. And she went on to complete her neurotology fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania prior to uh, beginning her faculty appointment at Temple. Um, she's the recipient of a core research training grant, uh, as well as the Torok uh, Vestibular Award from ANS and the Penn Pearls Clinical Teaching Award in 2021. Um, and today she'll be speaking with us about uh, management, primar primarily indications in surgical management of temporal bone trauma, which is an interesting topic and one that has a lot of variability in how people manage it and we encounter it all the time. So I'm really looking forward to hearing about her experiences and her talk. So thanks for being here. And uh, with that, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Josh, for uh, your generous introduction and for the honor of being able to give this talk to everybody. So um, just thank I want to thank everybody up front for for tuning in today. And, uh, you know, I just want to kind of give you a little bit of context, you know, temporal bone trauma. I, I think uh, Josh will attest we we trained in New York where a lot of it was motor vehicle accidents, pedestrian struck and, you know, the occasional elderly person who fell from standing. Uh, and coming up, uh, coming and starting up my career in North Philly, it's a very different kind of primordial soup for the temporal bone trauma that I see now. It's overwhelmingly interpersonal violence, a lot of gun violence, uh, as you'll see in some of the clinical cases at the end. So I just want to kind of note that I think sometimes these sorts of uh, factors, you know, we, we kind of group everything together. Oh, it's temporal bone trauma. But the reality is, you know, what drives the trauma that you see can can have a, a significant impact on on how how you manage how you manage it and, and what kind of factors might come into play. Um, so without further ado, let's let's get right into it. So um, starting off on the basic, you know, I just wanted to kind of hit on this. I keep on waiting for the day that I no longer show this slide in a temporal bone trauma uh, slide deck. But, you know, nomenclature has evolved over time and, and depending on what resources you're looking at, Certainly, we have this kind of older or old way of thinking about temporal bone fractures, which is you know, longitudinal versus transverse is mixed. Uh, for any residents on the call, uh, if this still makes it onto the in-service exam, you know, the longitudinal fractures are much more common. And as a result, they re represent 95% of facial work uh, for facial nerve weakness because of how common they are. But in terms of likelihood of having facial nerve palsy or otocapsule involvement, transverse is actually more likely. And here's kind of an example of how that looks. You're kind of looking at the triangular shape of the temporal bone, longitudinal being on its long axis and transverse being the opposite, and mixed being a, some kind of stellate lesion that involves both. And the way that we really think about it now in neurotology is, is, is a, a more clinically relevant way, which is otocapsule sparing or otocapsule involving or otocapsule violating, they mean the same thing. And essentially, this matters because what we really care about it are the complications of temporal bone fractures. So, you know, how likely is it that this patient you're telling me about has facial nerve paralysis, sensory neural hearing loss, some type of protracted vertigo? This is going to be way more common in otocapsule violating lesions. Um, and of course, these things can still occur, you know, without that otocapsule in, uh, uh, in otocapsule sparing lesions or without otocapsule violation, but it's just much less common. And here's an example. You can see this, you know, in the old nomenclature, this is certainly have been a, um, a transverse uh, fracture. So kind of in keeping with the statistics that I, I cited, but you can see it comes right through this, this structure um, here in the vestibule. And you can even see a little bit of uh, pneumococlea here. Um, and so, you know, mechanism of injury, I kind of touched on this right, right off the bat, but it's typically going to be a fairly substantial mechanism that causes a temporal bone fracture. Um, you know, motor vehicle accidents, bike and cycling accidents, certainly assault, certainly seizure, kind of loss of consciousness hitting. And then, you know, on occasion, you know, depending on the patient's health status, so, you know, kind of an old lady who fell from standing, you figure they're, they're somewhat frail at baseline. Typically, the mechanism is going to be coming from the side of the head or the occiput to cause this, and it can be both blunt or penetrating, though overwhelmingly, it tends to be a blunt trauma. Um, 
So clinical evaluation, you know, certainly we're going to ask about hearing loss. We're going to ask about vertigo. And along with that, if the patient has an appropriate mental status, you can try to do a tuning fork exam. You can look for a spontaneous nystagmus or, or gaze uh, provoked nystagmus. Um, we'll do an otoscopic exam. You'll typically see hemotympanum or blood in the EAC. You'll think about doing eardrops to kind of clear that up if there's an obstructive view of the eardrum. But I, I would put aside over caution that when you start those eardrops, it can, can muddy the picture when CSF leak is considered and it's on the table. And so if it really doesn't look like dry, dense, kind of thick, sticky blood, you want to consider the possibility of CSF odorrhea or in the right clinical settings, CSF rhinorrhea. And so here's an example of somebody who, you know, you, you get the sense that this is more watery than just kind of a bloody odorrhea. So this is an example of a situation where, uh, where I'm, you know, I'm thinking, okay, th there might be a component of CSF here. Um, who knows if it's just irrigation or something else, something they're wet for some reason over there, but I, I probably wouldn't necessarily start eardrops right away on this because you can take your time to clear it up. But if you're, you're kind of putting clear eardrops in that, in that ear and, and you're making it difficult to tell whether you're, whether you're concerned about CSF, um, and it's just one consideration, one, one more tool in, in your toolbox aside from beta two and, uh, and, and your, and your imaging review. And so, you know, one of the other things that we talk about regularly is early assessment of the facial nerve. Oftentimes, by the time our services is called, these patients may be intubated and sedated. And in that case, you, you might kind of just be limited to an grimace exam at best. But in, in some kind of key scenarios, you do want to get that sense of early on, you know, was the face moving when they came in? Is this a delayed kind of onset facial nerve paralysis occurring within, you know, 6, 12, 24, 48 hours? Um, and in which case you might be more inclined to, you're probably a lot more inclined to watch it, or is this somebody who came in with, with an immediate, uh, immediate facial palsy? Irrespective of the timing, certainly if they have incomplete eye closure, then you're thinking about eye care um, to protect that cornea. Um, imaging, uh, CT temporal bone non-contrast, that's what, you know, we, we love in neurotology, but do take a look at the existing imaging. Most trauma protocols in this day and age do include some millimeter slice thickness through the skull. And there's good data from uh, from from uh, Supacol and, and and company from just from uh, not too long ago at all, showing that the trauma head CT is actually sufficient in in the in majority of cases. So, you know, take a look at it instead of upfront just saying, "Oh, call me back when you have a CT temporal bone." A lot of times, you'll you'll be surprised at how good the scan actually is. All right, so um, you know you want to have a system. Yeah, and any system will work when you're reviewing the imaging as long as it's comprehensive. And, and this is kind of mine. I like to start with the axial and then I try to, you know, the, the basic thing here is I want to hit all the things that matter, but I'm going to follow the fracture line last. I think there's a tendency or this desire sometimes to just beeline to the fracture line. And I think if you're not systematic, you, you can easily miss things. And and for for those of you who are especially neurotology bound, I think you're you're gonna you're gonna be the the source, right? You're you're the person you look at more CT temporal bones than than anybody else in the health system. And so really having a system is, is critical. So I like to start with the middle, you know, the air air filled spaces, right? So mastoid, middle ear, looking at the opacification, and and really kind of focusing on where those things are collecting. Look at the ossicles. Is there separation? Are they where they belong? Um, do they seem to have you know uh, some kind of a sign of discontinuity. Um, look at the facial nerve, the status all, all the way along, and certainly look at the otocapsule, look at the posterior fossa skull base, look intracranial, and that's all kind of my axial stuff. Uh, and then I follow the fracture line and kind of see, okay, now, now where exactly, what is the relationship of anything I identify to the fracture line? Then I do the same thing on the coronal. I like to use coronal for the EAC. Um, again, some, of the, some overlap here, and then of course the tegmin, and, and then I follow the fracture line last. Um, facial nerve palsy, you know, if you're looking at facial nerve, somebody patient with a patient with facial nerve palsy and you're looking at imaging, you really want to look, okay, is there a fracture line just generally through the area? Is, does it involve the facial, the fallopian canal itself? Is there like a spiky bone fragment that's, that's, uh, kind of impaled the facial nerve? Uh, and then, you know, in blunt trauma, the most common location, and as a result, the most common location overall is going to be perigeniculate, which includes the geniculate itself, labyrinthine segment, the proximal tympanic segment. And if you're thinking about some kind of decompression or, or some type of nerve repair, then you're thinking, okay, as I'm reviewing the imaging, what approach would I need to get to this area? Um, in terms of facial nerve testing, you know, this is again, this would be this is blunt trauma and certainly other indications. But in the in the setting of this talk, we're, we're focused on blunt trauma for this. Uh, you're get looking at an enog at least three days afterwards uh, to allow for Wallerian degeneration. 
you're comparing the compound action potential to two sides. And if it's greater than 90%, then you're thinking, you know, we might want to decompress this person. There's no role for ENOG in an incomplete paralysis. And if you have an unfortunate patient who does have a bilateral paralysis, I know of one case of this, you, you unfortunately can't get an ENOG in that situation. Um, and then in some cases, you know, repeat ENOG for continuing assessment may be helpful. A lot of that data is actually in the Bell's palsy uh, population rather than here. But certainly if you have somebody who's kind of not getting better, they don't quite meet that threshold, but maybe they're close, it wouldn't be unreasonable to reassess um, a few days later. Um, so EMG, you know, this is uh, some people after they have a greater than 90% um, degeneration on ENOG, they'll they'll confirm that with a facial EMG just to make sure, you know, they're not getting anything um, surprising, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, active reinnervation or something strange, um, just to kind of confirm that testing. And so I, I just put this on here. Honestly, this is not a routine part of my practice, um, partly because we just, I really haven't seen that much blunt trauma that actually meets this criteria to begin with. Um, but, uh, but, it, it, but it is out there and it's something that everybody should be aware of. All right, so uh, moving along to kind of specific complications um, that we think about. So uh, middle ear and external auditory canal and external auditory canal laceration generally is going to heal on its own. You really don't need to do anything about it. Um, when these patients do follow up, I, you know, you can't even tell where it is in the majority of cases. Um, though occasionally, and I'll, I'll show a case of this later on, there, there can be in, in select injuries a concern for EAC stenosis and things of that nature. TM perforation, again, traumatic etiology also typically will heal, but may need intervention. Uh, your general options here are going to be do nothing and live with it, get a hearing aid, or certainly you can offer this patient a tympanoplasty. Generally, I think most individuals would offer at least three months of observation and then kind of see how they're doing, but the size of the perforation and their clinical progression may impact your decision making there. Ossicular chain problems. So this can be upfront or this can actually be delayed as well. So upfront, the most common is going to be incutomalleolar discontinuity or dislocation. You know, so the ice cream is falling off the cone. Um, here you can, you know, offer an aciculoplasty or you can do a hearing aid or you can observe. Um, many people would kind of allow that hemotympanum that's in the ear to, to resolve first, you know, see how much of a conductive component is actually attributable here. And of course, the degree of dislocation discontinuity would affect your decision making process. Um, here's an example of a patient. Um, this patient was in a cycling accident, and, you know, very minimal here. We ended up just observing and she had a very honestly, very minimal, like, you know, 10 to 15 dB conductive hearing loss only at a couple of frequencies in the end uh, at, at kind of final her last uh, her last audiogram. Um, in terms of a circular chain discontinuity, you know, you can also have delayed um, kind of inc incus necrosis, long, long standing after um, head trauma. And so that's another thing I'll typically ask about. All right. In terms of inner ear issues, this would typically be from an otic capsule involving fracture, but it can occur from labyrinthine concussion. This has been well demonstrated by a couple different groups. Um, so fracture, in this case, the fracture doesn't actually involve the otic capsule, doesn't violate the otic capsule, but the patient does get sensory inhaling loss and or vertigo. Um, the vertigo, generally, it's going to improve just with supportive management. The, these patients get treated kind of like a post-concussive disorder. Um, any acute vertigo you can manage with the PRN meds and then certainly vestibular rehab, and they typically compensate fairly well over time. Sensory he neural hearing loss may or may not get better on its own. And that's just kind of an observation and management accordingly. Um, if you have early sensory neural hearing loss without, you know, the lunable labyrinth, if there isn't an overt or capsule fracture, not unreasonable to offer these patients steroids, see if that'll kind of help them along. And then if they meet can candidacy criteria, the, the data suggests that there's benefit even with a delayed placement and regardless of the etiology, meaning if they have um, an otic kind of like a otic concussion type picture, or if they have an otic capsule violating picture, there it's reasonable, you know, to treat them like any other patient. You shouldn't change that management or candidacy assessment simply because they've had this temporal bone fracture. And now there's been this other question of, you know, should we be considering early implantation? If the patient has an otic capsule fracture, there's this concern for labyrinthitis ossificans, and apparently it's it's actually fairly controversial. There's been some decent temporal bone histopathology studies done, and and the bottom line is that in the even in the implanted ear. There isn't a consistent. There isn't consistent evidence of actually, you know, ossificans. So um, the bottom line is, you, you know, do the scan. You could take a look at it if they are, you know, if you're in a system where you can offer it early. You certainly you wouldn't be wrong to do it. 
um, but but it's not you know mandatory or as urgent as the way we might typically think of say meningitis. All right, so facial nerve palsy, you know, I, I do give steroids regardless of whether it's a complete, incomplete, with, you know, the exact scenario, incomplete paralysis, I should say, you know, will generally heal on its own. Uh, it typically has a better prognosis, though certainly you can have some, you know, uh, persistent. Uh, the board answer for decompression after electrodiagnostic testing for complete facial palsy is going to be within 14 days. But a lot of times, you know, in clinical practice, that may not be, you know, that may not be feasible. You know, you may not be able to get medical clearance for an intracranial operation within 14 days. And so there's a lot of data out there suggesting, you know, certainly up to three weeks. And 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 there's some people out there reporting as, as late as six to eight. Um, as a as a as a young person, I, I admit again, I have not personally been involved in this decision making process. I think, you know, beyond the 21 days, you, you're kind of really asking yourself, you know, why, why am I offering this and what is the benefit to the patient at this point? But under 21, you know, so even though the board answer is within 14, under 21, I think is is, is well within reason. All right. The approach here for, with the uh, intact hearing uh, is generally going to be, you know, middle cranial faucet access the perigeniculate. There are some case reports that suggest efficacy with an endoscopic transcanal approach to this. Um, it's out there. I, I think still most people are doing middle cranial fossa. If the hearing loss itself is profound, if there's other considerations, such as a concurrent CSF leak, you can certainly consider a translab approach. And then one of the most important things is that your best outcome is typically going to be House Brackman 3 in these patients, and you want to counsel patients and their families accordingly. All right, CSF leak. This is fairly common. Um, you know, I, at, at least in my, my practice thus far, uh, it's, it's fairly common to see some CSF leak after temporal bone trauma, uh, partic particularly when you know that the skull base has been involved in some way. We do typically advise antibiotic coverage for this, these traumatic leaks, you know, as, as opposed to uh, spontaneous due to presumed wound contamination, but that itself is also somewhat controversial. It's difficult to study. It's hard to power a study enough to know whether antibiotics have made a difference. Um, but certainly, you know, no, knowing that it was a traumatic uh, injury, I, I err on the side of antibiotics. Um, in most of these cases, with some exceptions, and I'll give you a couple examples of those, we'll observe first. We'll, we'll watch it for seven to 10 days. It's just with standard bed rest, oftentimes a lumbar drain, uh, stool softeners if, if, if applicable, and, and just see. And, and in many cases, particularly with Tegman injuries, um, these guys will heal right up. Depending on the rate of flow, you'll typically see this observation period of like anywhere between one to two weeks. For me, by, by seven days, you know, I, I'm really, really thinking about it. I think where, where I ever get close to two weeks would be if they had some other, you know, medical concern that precluded real consideration of the OR or if it's like the a timing, you know, where, where Monday is day 10. <clears throat> um, some series report as high as 60 to 70 percent self-resolving. And some people consider, you know, acetazolamide as well. Um, if they're still leaking, you know, or it's such a high flow that it's not likely to resolve, you consider intervention. And I just made a little note here about posterior fossa because in my experience, and, you know, I, I tried to see if I could find an, a literature, like anything in literature, like clearly proving this in the trauma, in, in trauma, um, but I, it just, posterior fossa doesn't seem to close up um, as much as middle cranial fossa. Now, granted, that's also probably related to the underlying mechanism of injury, you know, the, the shear mechanism to, to kind of interrupt the posterior fossa versus the tegmin. Um, you know, tegmin's very thin. You also have the temporal lobe kind of coming down on an upright patient, whereas posterior fossa in a supine or upright patient, you figure the cerebellum is kind of falling away from it. Maybe, maybe this has a role in, in, in why they do or do not seem to resolve with conservative management. All right. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and move into uh, three different clinical cases uh, to kind of demonstrate some of these concepts. Um, these are all cases from within last year. Um, that 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 we saw at Temple, um, and I hope they'll kind of provoke some interesting discussion and thought for the group. So first case, this is a 19-year-old gentleman, uh, his gunshot wound to the right, uh, entry room was kind of parietal, exit kind of through the occipital parietal, kind of back here, exit was through the zygoma. The in initial CT showed this injury to the right parietal lesion. Uh, we were not called, a lot of kind of intracranial injuries, small focus of pneumocephalus, um, and the patient was brought to the OR with neurosurgery for a middle cranial fossa for removal of the um, for, of the bullet fragments um, in, in the kind of these different areas, the squamous temporal bone, the superior temporal gyrus, they evacuated hematoma. Post-op day one, right off the bat, he has this kind of robust otorrhea. So our team swings by, he's alert and oriented, totally awake guy. He's got right, clear, pulsatile, watery otorrhea, very classic. 
And there's a soft tissue defect in the lateral EAC. There's a little bit of fat herniation there. Medially, there's blood contents, but after you suction, you can see the TM. It's a little bit limited because of the uh, edema, but it's intact. And the middle ear is clear. There's, there isn't even hemotympanum in this guy. You can see where the exit wound is from the bullet and the facial movement on this side is intact. So um, here's the um, here's the axial scan. I'm going to kind of go through it a couple times to show you guys. You see a little bit of this encephalus coming down. There's that bullet fragment. This is the initial presentation. And you kind of can see the mastoid, you know, why we weren't initially called, right? The mastoid seems largely uninvolved. The middle ear is largely uninvolved. And you just kind of see where I'm describing of, okay, some mixture of blood contents and soft tissue swelling out in the lateral EAC. You can see where all the bullet fragments have kind of laid out. Um, again, coming back down. Pretty unremarkable mass rate air cells. The ossicles themselves are fine as well. You can really see it's really just EAC. But you look at the guy and he's pouring CSF out. Um, so then we go on to the cor coronal and I'll tell you, I studied this guy's scan for a while, trying to figure out, you know, what our what our role was going to be um, and why it's coming out the ear. But where we kind of landed was, you could see, you know, radiology kind of pointed out a couple of these things here. I wasn't too impressed by that. If you come out, you can see where the defect is kind of in the, you know, just above the, just above the temporal bone. And if you come out to where the EAC is, there's a little bit of a chip at the end, right here. A little bit of a chip. Whoop, hold on. Let's see if I can bring it back a touch. Right here. There's like a little bit of a chip, and I'm like, maybe, maybe that's it. But you know, so we we managed him, you know, initially conservatively, me thinking, you know, middle cranial fossa, the scan is so impressive, it slowed substantially, but it just kept going. Um, it did stop at 15 cc's an hour, but once we clamped it and tried to take that lumbar drain out, it just came right back. We brought him the OR, back to the OR, middle cranial fossa, did a cranial plasty, and just like a very lateral uh, temporalis muscle rotational flab. And so there was this kind of stellate fracture at the lateral EAC, and we did, you know, we put a little bit of bone cement, a little durgin over that, and then did the rotational flap over it. And then he did fine. Um, you know, they, they found, so this is kind of one of the reasons I brought up the eardrops. They had been restarted on their own by the ICU team. And so there was this scant clear fluid and we suctioned it out. We told them to stop the eardrops and then it was dry post-op day two to three until discharge uh, about another week later. Ultimately, he was lost to follow up. But this is one gentleman where, you know, even though we talk about these EAC lacerations is largely healing up, I was quite concerned that he might stenose uh, over time just with that fat herniation. But unfortunately, he didn't, he didn't come back for me to take a look at him. So um, just a one situation where where my my statement about EAC lacerations may not end up being true. Um, so some take home points from this case, you know, most MCF traumatic leads do respond to conservative management, but obviously not all. Um, the trajectory and the mechanism injury are both important considerations. You know, maybe if this had been like a little crack from I don't know a more of like a blunt trauma, maybe he would have been fine. But because it was a penetrating trauma with bullet wound and, and just the sheer fo shearing forces, maybe some of the uh, shrapnel that's coming around it, um, maybe that's why he had such a robust uh, leak uh, and in such kind of an unusual situation, uh, such an unusual location, excuse me. And then, you know, in general, I think, you know, it's a, it's a nice little reminder that the middle cranial fossa just remains a workhorse for tegmin repairs, you know, even in these kind of weird places that you might not typically think about or typically be looking at it. You, you can offer a multi-layer repair and your, your available options abound for, for what those different uh, materials are going to be. Going on to case number two. <clears throat> so this is a 40-year-old gentleman, right side gunshot wound again, multiple severe intracranial injuries, common unit right temporal bone fracture at the time of presentation, had immediate um, decompressive subaccip uh, craniectomy with the neurosurgery team now with uh, persistent CSF otorrhea postoperatively. So we swing by, we examine him, he's intubated, he's sedated, he's got that decompressive crany, the right, he's got a right house Brackman, six out of six facial palsy, um, huge, huge amount of um, otorrhea, he's just pouring CSF out of the ear, we suction and suction, just, we can't even get it slowed down long enough to see the TM. And so here's a scan, this is before his crany, this is the, the scan at presentation, and so, you know, pretty fuzzy, but you can see he's just, I mean, his temporal bone is just destroyed. Massive uh, 
posterior fossa defect coming right through the middle of all the things that we love and care about in the temporal bone. So all the way through, you see a little bit of shrapnel and just absolutely tanked. So, you know, we took them right in. I mean, I, I think in this scenario, I, the reason I put this case in is to just show that, you know, yeah, like ideally in many situations you would offer a lumbar drain, but this guy is never going to close up with a lumbar drain, right? He's he's pouring out so quickly that we can't see the tympanic membrane. He has this huge bullet created defect uh, in the posterior fossa. I, I you know, we, we really just didn't wait around. So we went ahead, brought into the OR, we did a right subtotal petrosectomy. We did an ear canal closure and cranialized the ear with an abdominal fat graft. Um, there was a robust CSF leak throughout the case in the mastoid. It made it really difficult to kind of see. We did briefly explore just to see if we could see any remnants of the facial nerve, anything at all. We did find a proximal stump, uh, but we just couldn't find anything distally that we would even attempt to repair. So we, we left that alone. Um, so we went ahead and incised the IS joints, moved the <clears throat> osteoclast lateral to the stapes, moved the TM, removed the cutaneous EAC, you know, nice closure with an inversion of, of the edges. And then um, fat graft with bone cement and a tight periosteal closure uh, with a running walking watertight seal on the skin. Post-op, he had no further leakage uh, from the mastoid. Eight weeks post-op, though, he did have a CSF leak from his suboccipital incision. He was found to have a pseudomeningocele. seal. Um, and so as I bring this up because uh, he had a post-op scan as a result. And so the hydra set that we used, the bone cement, was actually a radio pick on imaging. So you can actually see the, the repair out here. And obviously, I didn't put anything down here. It was like right on dura. It was too wet. So this is just a fat graph um, closure and, the, <clears throat> and a little bit of, uh, of the bone cement out laterally. Um, all right. So take home points for this case. You know, posterior fossa leaks, you know, in general, I think, you know, you'll see that this really requires a substantial mechanism really don't have to wait for the lumbar drain where the defect clearly has no chance at self-resolution. Um, and, you know, cranialization is effective surgical intervention, even with these like really robust, you, you feel like, oh my God, this this thing is just pouring out. And, and I even noted, I was looking back at this case, I had noted that he really was leaking throughout that case until the periosteal layer was closed. So it was really fast, but, you know, it's just, it's, it's you know, you're kind of, um, your hammer, your, your, final, your final move, if you absolutely have to, the cranialization is going to work. All right, except when it doesn't, which is why I bring up case number three. So case number three is a little, uh, an interesting case um, as well. 47-year-old male, long-standing left hearing loss, interestingly, lucky in a way if you think about it. So this guy had meningitis as a, as a young child, had left hearing loss, and now, you know, 45, almost 50 years later, he intervened in an altercation in his family, and he was stabbed with a pocket knife right through that left ear, the same side that he had kind of hearing loss since childhood. Immediate facial paralysis ringing in the left ear, bloody otorrhea. On exam, he's got a left six out of six facial palsy. Um, the EAC had a very limited exam. It's very narrow, soft tissue herniation, can't really see anything except blood and, and herniated soft tissue. Um, uh, and then on hospital day three, he starts leaking clear otorrhea from the left ear. So this was that presentation. I'm now, I realize I'm not showing you a whole lot here. I just want to show you the incision line, kind of the, the injury line, excuse me, comes right through the tragus. So this little, this tiny little um, mark among a sea of blood, that, that's where it came in. So he kind of skived, this pocket knife basically skived all along the EAC, fracturing that EAC um, and uh, kind of injuring the tragus along the way. So you can see there's a little bit of bone. If you tympanum, them, you can see the, the ossicles are, are way out. And I'll zoom in a couple of the key findings, but you can see there's this fracture line along the EAC, just kind of bone fragments in the EAC itself. And of course, it come, it's coming right into where the facial nerve is. There's a little bit of pneumocephalus, you know, and really just this one, boom, right in the side of the head. I was actually a little surprised by the pneumocephalus, just, you know, maybe I shouldn't have been, but just based on the mechanism alone, um, and the absence of other kind of blunt force trauma, at least described by the patient, um, really substantial injury. And then I, just for, you know, kind of zooming in, he had some pneumococlea here, pneumolabyrinth alongside the pneumocephalus. And, you know, that's all, that's all new. This is where, you know, we figure the fracture line is right, right through there. And then here's that ossicular disruption. Here's kind of, they're everywhere. Facial nerve transection right through the middle. And again, another image of pneumocephalus here. So we got an MRI for the pneumocephalus just to make sure there wasn't any other intrinsic brain injury or something else that, you know, neurosurgery might want to be aware of or, or know about. And we had neurosurgery consult to just to clear. 
we started steroids just because, you know, even though obviously here you're expecting a total transection just to kind of reduce any edema on the residual remnants, I guess. And I started eye care and then went ahead and consented him for surgery. So, you know, same thing here, even though there was this, you know, CSF leak uh, kind of started, my feeling was, you know, is there, I didn't really see the sense in if we had to go in there anyway to, to kind of, and you figure this is a, a posterior fossil leak coming around the area of the old window, we, we should probably just go ahead and get in there instead of waiting around, making it harder and harder to find the remnant facial nerve. Um, and, and, and so we, we went ahead, left, we did modified radical tympanomastoidectomy, we did a ear canal closure. We did cranialize the ear with an abdominal fat graft, and we found the edges, you know, kind of around the tympanic segment. So there's facial nerve laceration through the tympanic segment, found the proximal stump, and we had consented for a, a greater auricular nerve graft, but we actually we're, we are actually able to mobilize a vertical segment um, kind of more into the middle ear, and we did a primary neurography. The CSF leak itself was coming from the outer capsule, just like all, all around the oval window, just bone fragments. Um, we took out what we could, put an abdominal fat graft in the area, did an ear canal closure, and closed off the eustachian tube with uh, muscle fat and bone wax. And these are just some intraoperative photos. Sorry, these are pictures of pictures, but just kind of going more or less in order. So here's the proximal stump. Um, and then here I've uh, kind of un unroofed the um, vertical segment of the facial nerve to kind of, and then brought it, and then I mobilized it immediately out of the fallopian canal. And this is my bloody picture of a primary refer a couple nylons in there. Um, so he, he did all right post-op. We discharged him on oral steroids. We referred him for a prompt gold weight by our facial plastic surgeon. He was doing well, no leak, no issues at two weeks post-op. And I had mentioned, you know, the cranializations, you know, a great, uh, a great intervention, great outcomes, you know, it's going to work, it's going to work. And of course, this guy, another week after I see him, comes up to the ER and he's got left-sided, which is so ipsilateral to the injury, rhinorrhea with exertion, along with dizziness, kind of tinnitus. If he lies flat, it goes away, you know, I mean, very... You know, if it's, he read the textbook on a, on CSF rhinorrhea, right? So we collect the drainage very, very slowly over two to three days because we just have struggle, struggle. We kind of struggle getting the volume, and this is negative for beta two transparent, but he just remains symptomatic. And so we, you know, with our rhinologist, we kind of talked about it at length. Like, you know, do we put in the lumbar drain? Managing, he's three weeks out. Here he's having these issues, you know, and and when you ask him, he claims that oh, actually these symptoms were there since post op. I just didn't mention it at the post op visit. So ultimately, we figured, look, the beta two is negative, but the story sure sounds like a like a leak. Um, every time I get up, anytime I move, anytime I lift something, I'm getting you know clear clear rhinorrhea out of the side, the same side as the injury. And so um, he went to the OR with our rhinologist for transnasal endoscopic eustachian tube closure. She just reopened the same exact uh, abdominal fat graft incision and and kind of and and, and plug that right up. Uh, and that was four weeks post op from the initial intervention. You know, post op day five from that, he says he still has kind of the same symptoms. We're scoping him, we're looking, we can't see anything. Uh, and and then we got a CT MRI, just showed post op changes, nothing really telling. And so at this point, he's just getting kind of conservative management with some nasal spray, sinus rinses, just monitoring to see if if he'll recuperate some facial nerve movement uh, after all of this. Um, so you know, that kind of brings me back around, take home points for this case. You know, whenever you're possible, you know, you want to do a primary facial nerve repair if you can. You may have to move that facial nerve to get it, but, you know, you do want to be prepared for some kind of nerve graft. Greater RIC is a great option. You're there. If you're comfortable getting it, get it. Sural nerve is also certainly an option if you have somebody who, if you're comfortable with it or you're, you have somebody comfortable with that. You know, eustachian tube closure by rhinology is, is safe. It's effective. Um, you know, there are plenty of case series out there on this. And it may be a reasonable consideration if you have a persistent leak and despite, you know, what you feel to have been a maximal intervention on the lateral skull base. And then, you know, I, I think I I think about this guy every now and then I still wonder, you know, did he ever did he ever need it? You know, his beta two was negative and I never really saw him lean forward and have like the turn on the faucet thing. But I do feel like it was the right thing to do because I'd much rather him go through what he went through, then get a meningitis, you know, and, and have major, major, you know, you know, life-threatening issues from that. And so I do think I, I stand by and I would advise you to kind of stick to your clinical judgment, try to just do the right thing for the patient. Maybe don't get too hung up on the beta 2 transferrin or, or any one uh, test otherwise. All right. So I think right, right on uh, between 540 and 545, I'd like to go ahead and
open up for discussion and any questions that you guys might have. Awesome. awesome. Thank, Thank you so thanks. much. Um, I, I have a couple of questions myself and then others, though, feel free to jump in or if you want to type it in the chat as well, that's fine. Um, just in relation to the first case and also you, you mentioned, you know, use of lumbar drain in the, in the context of CSF leak, traumatic CSF leak in a, in a number of instances. And I was thinking overall, what's your approach to when you think um, when you pull the plug and saying like, listen, like this patient needs a lumbar drain in general, like are there cases of low flow leaks, you give it a few days, are there cases where you just look at it initially on clinical presentation, you say, look, like this is, this is definitely going to need it. Um, and yeah. then, so like, and so in terms of the lumbar drain, and then I was just also curious specifically for that first case, um, given that you, you, it seemed like you likely suspected that the leak was originating probably from a, a lateral source in the, in the mid fossa did you consider doing trying to go transmastoid there or were you or how did you make the decision to definitely do a middle cranial fossa for that given that it didn't seem like it likely extended over the ossicles or medially and did it have anything to do with the fact that they already had a craniactivity middle fossa i was just curious about kind of those two things yeah great questions so um with respect to the um first one regarding lumbar drain so i think as a general rule, these cases, you know, the selected cases notwithstanding, I, I err on the side of offering conservative management first. You know, I think with case number one, you know, we, we offered the lumbar drain because I felt like, you know, this is, I can barely, you know, I'm having to look really hard to figure out where the defect is. I, you know, clinically, I'm having trouble correlating the imaging with what I see, um, but I, I don't see any reason to, to not give it a shot, right? The guy's alert oriented, he's fine put in the lumbar drain, see what happens, see if it'll stop, give it the week, and, and let's see. And he, he did stop. It took a while. It, he stopped, but it just obviously recurred. And so I think in general, I look, for, I, I have to have a reason not to offer the lumbar drain. So in the second case, you know, obviously massive defect, super robust, like this was never going to stop. And I feel like anybody who, you know, met this patient, saw it pouring out of his ear, would, would probably agree uh, just with the extent of injury. Um, with the third case, I think, you know, maybe in a world where that gentleman, you know, it's hard to imagine this, but, you know, he had the CSF leak, but no facial nerve, you know, my, I was planning to take him in anyway. Um, so my feeling was, you know, I didn't really want to delay the facial nerve intervention on the off chance that this posterior fossa leak does close with a lumbar drain. So I think in general, middle cranial fossa, I'm very much willing to give the patient a shot, um, unless there's another reason again for us to be there or something like that. There's some other, you know, strange factor. You'd have to give me a reason not to try the lumbar drain. For posterior fossa, I have a lower threshold to just intervene, just because generally, in my experience, based on what I've seen, and it just doesn't seem to close up as well with conservative management. But if they there's no reason to rush in, I'd still give them a shot, um, even if it's just to say I could. Uh, in terms of the transmastoid approach, so, you know, the reason, part of the reason we went middle cranial fossa, a great question. Uh, I didn't really go from behind. I mean, part of it was because it was very, very lateral. And I kind of wanted to see if there was any problem with where their craniectomy was. Like, is this actually coming from almost like above up here and come, dissecting through the soft tissues in, in some way? Just because if, you know, if we go back to that case, it really, the mastoid was just so unimpressive that I really felt like, you know, I might go in the mastoid and then have no access to anything else. Um, and so if you, if we look up here, I, sh I probably should have put in here something where, you know, you can see where the defect is here for them. You know, it's massive here. They, they have this huge, you know, huge area. And so, whereas the, really the, you almost have to like squint and, and pretend a little bit <laughs> with, with the, with the ear canal. And then even if you come here, transmastoid, my feeling was, am I going to get adequate exposure of the dura, right? Because by definition, there's some kind of dural tear somewhere. Um, so really, I, I honestly did not um, entertain the idea of a transmastoid approach for this case, both because of where I felt the primary bony defect was and figuring that transmastoid, lateral EAC, I'm not going to have great exposure of the actual dural defect uh, to address that problem. All right. Yeah, thanks. And so yeah. and also just with follow up regarding the lumbar drain, what about 
cases where they have a bit of a leak, but you don't, you just watch the leak for a little while without, like, not surgery versus drain, but just like drain versus nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that it's a good question. I think, you know, I, I don't like to give it too long with an active leak. Um, you know, obvious, I typically would make that decision in conjunction with neurosurgery and make a judgment based on the mechanism and type of injury. For penetrating injuries, I tend to have a lower threshold, you know, so bullet wounds, you know, knife wound, whatever, lower threshold to just go ahead with lumbar drain. For blunt injury, you figure there's some shearing force, especially if there isn't some like obvious fracture line that I can identify. I think it's very reasonable just to watch them, bed rest, no lumbar drain at all. Um, so really a lot of it is a combination of how robust is it, <laughs> you know, certainly very robust, regardless of the mechanism, I'd probably go ahead with lumbar drain. But the situation you're talking about where it's really kind of scant, Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. If somebody suctioned it re recently, you might think it, have, it might have stopped. Then I would look at the mechanism. Uh, and if you can really find an obvious source where you're like, ooh, I probably would go ahead because you're really thinking there might be surgery. But I, I do think most people, the vast majority of consults that we get fall in the, the other category, which is a little bit of a leak, a maybe leak, a maybe not leak. Um, and, and so I, I think it's totally fine not, not to even go there with the lumbar drain, just, just see how they do and let them fly. Um, and this is why, you know, that point about the eardrops, I think, can be so important because it's such a th like, I mean, how often do we as, as neurologists and CNTs just say, yeah, and then, you know, start the patient on some eardrops, but it can really muddy the picture in these circumstances. So ironically, I find myself more often telling them to stop the eardrops just so we can see if anything is coming out. And then you can always clear up the hemotympan or, you know, the blood in the EAC later on. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh Another another kind of topic that uh, we didn't touch on too much was the the question of uh, va vascular whether whether arterial or venous um, abnormalities following trauma. I mean, there's obviously the, the clear clear case of if you have a carotid injury with bleeding from it. But I was just curious about your approach to say see a, uh, if you see any changes in the in the canal the carotid canal, for instance. But there's obviously no bleeding going on, uh, what's your approach in terms of the type of vascular imaging you might do and the timing of it? And then also with regards to dural venous thrombosis that might follow trauma, how you how you kind of approach, approach uh, the venous and arterial side of things? Uh, great, great question. So CTA, CTV definitely are my preferred imaging studies. Truth be told, in many circumstances, at least at Temple, this has already been done. Um, it's already been done by the time we're called. Like they they know this involves some kind, you know, the peach is carotid or there's some kind of fracture line in that area, through that area. There's, you know, a question, you know, it, it's already been done, you know, uh, overnight along with whatever additional trauma series imaging they got after the initial survey. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I can't really think of a case where venous injury in this setting came up, but certainly CTA. Um, uh, and, and, you know, honestly that, that just comes down to, you know, inter, you know, in, uh, interventional, you know, either, you know, n the neurosurgical team or, you know, kind of determining what to do from there. Uh, it's not something that I would say I, I have really been primarily involved with, but certainly I, I would look for it. And if it's missing, I would tell them they need it. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was kind of curious about like the case where you see it. A thrombosed dural venous sinus, sigmoid or transverse sinus is thrombosed, and in the case right. of head trauma, like you don't want to anticoagulate them. So I was curious if you right. if you had experience using like mannitol or how you how you kind of thought about that. I honestly don't. I honestly don't. But you know, I think part of it is also this can probably be institutional, right? Temple sees a lot of trauma. You know, there's a lot of trauma in North Philly, and so the neurosurgical team is very, you know, along with the trauma surgical team, they're just very in in sync, and we kind of. I feel that at least my role in an institution like that, I don't really uh, have a say in the matter. <laughs> Neurosurgery and trauma are going to duke it out. And as long as I, you know, my role is very much limited to kind of the the considerations that I've laid out in the talk. Yeah. Cool. But it's a good I think, question. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, Alex Churn raised his hand here as a question for you. Hey, hey, Tiffany, Alex here. Thanks for really, really, really amazing lecture. Um, <laughs> super informative. Uh, I, I actually had three questions, kind of random. Um, one of them was when you, when you showed your uh, kind of your surgical approaches and you know what you actually did in uh, intra-op for uh, to these cases, when you mentioned 
cranialization. This might mm -hmm. just be like a semantics thing, but are are you is is cranialization and like obliteration the same thing? Because I I was just thinking of it from like a frontal science mm -hmm. standpoint. When people say like yeah. frontal sinus cranialization, they just mean you take down the posterior table so the so the brain right. you know goes forward. Whereas obliteration is you just pack with you know glitter with fat right. or whatever thing. Um, that's that's a good yeah. question. I guess by I guess by that token, I would argue the first guy I basically cranialized because he had like almost no posterior fossa. You know, I'm like right on cerebellum, and the second one more like an obliteration. But I wrote cranialization in my op note, so that's what I put here. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. I mean, I think you know the way I'm thinking about it is that the ear is now the brain, right? We're we're basically taking the ear out of play. We're saying there's no other way for me to stop this leak uh, at this point. There's no other way for me to put something here that's going to kind of stop um, this level of a leak in this area. And so I'm making the ear more part of the intracranial cavity than I am, you know, part of the ear. Got it. Um, that makes sense. And then in the third case, like, do you feel like there's a role for, um, you know, when it's not like a slam dunk CSF leak, like in that case, uh, post-op when, um, you know, you brought it up after he had surgery for like MRI uh, cystinography yeah, or radionuclei cystinography. Yeah. So that's, that's going to be our next. Step. This guy is a relatively recent case. So I'm, yeah, great question. That's going to be our next. He's still, you know, at this point, you know, we, he was going in like post op day five or kind of like, all right, well, we don't see anything, you know, we don't see anything. Let's let him settle out, give him nasal spray, sinus rinses, see if he's still there. If it's still there, we'll do cisternography. Got it. And then third small question is, uh, when you mentioned that the rhinologist, uh, they uh, pack the eustachian tube, did that mean with fat, you mean they just like shove eustachian tube through the eustachian, yeah. or shove fat through the eustachian? Did that, did that actually work? I, I can't imagine that actually working, but. No, it does. I mean, I, I'd, I'd seen it a couple of times in fellowship for, you know, kind of a similar situation. In one case, you know, it was also trauma. The other case is actually a, a trans lab that leaked, you know, it was totally closed on this side. So they came, you know, endoscopically did an ET. Yeah, it works. Um, some people throw in like a cerclage type stitch, but I don't have to. Um, so they'll just put a bunch of material in there. If it's fat, then fine. If it's, you know, muscle, if it's all, you know, a combination thereof, just depends on where they're going to get their, you know, graft material from and what they're going to put in. But yeah, it, it does work. Uh, it's, uh, it's well reported. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. And I had one other question myself and then, um, I'll let anyone else jump in. Um, otherwise, we, you know, we're getting close to six o'clock, and I want to respect everyone's time. But um, I was curious about how you think about managing uh, traumatic perilymphatic fistula and something that kind of can present in a more delayed and progressive fashion. And what what kind of perks your ears up for that? How you kind of pull the plug on getting imaging, and when you when you take someone for exploration in that setting? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, I mean, the honest to God truth is I haven't encountered this yet, but uh, um, tr truth be told, I, I think this is like a little controversial. I will tell you, I've had some mentors who basically, they question the existence of paralymphatic fistula, period. And then I've had some who've gone and done kind of like oval window around window reinforcement or things like that and kind of, you know, uh, plugged up around it. I think, um, you know, I, and so with those caveats in mind, um, I think it really depends on what they're coming in with, right? Is, is it this like, is it like a fluctuating hearing loss thing? Is it predominantly vertiginous? Um, I think, and it also depends on their initial, you know, what was the mechanism of injury up front? You know, what, what did everything show? Um, I think, you know, I, I think a patient for me anyway, and I, I'm not, I don't know, I'm not saying this is right. Um, I think a lot of it is a product of my training and, and the culture with which I, you know, am, I'm accustomed I think they'd have to really, really convince me that that's what's going on. Um, they'd have to really, really, really convince me with a combination of, you know, I, I probably, I'd be happy to get in, you know, an upfront, you know, CT scan, how much how, and how frequently that's going to show anything, hard to say. Um, I'd probably manage them, you know, with like steroids and things like that for their, you know, for any drops in hearing that they may or may not have. 
Uh, and then, you know, you can always offer a middle ear exploration and, and just kind of, they understand the risks and want to see if it feels any better. I'm willing to offer it, but I just like, I honestly haven't, uh, I don't have enough, uh, gray hair to have encountered that straight, you know, straight on and, and not enough to give you like a really eloquent answer on how, you know, my paradigm would be. I think there are probably so many variables that I would just err on the side of trying to help the person in front of me. Um, and, and as long as they understand what the risks are, you know, I'll give it a shot. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. I'll be I'll be I'll be silent for about 10 seconds and see if anyone else wants to jump in. Otherwise, um, we can conclude things. I'll stop sharing my screen for a second, too. <laughs> Cool. I, I, I really appreciate uh, you coming, uh, Dr. Peng Hua. Nice to see you. Uh, and um, it was a really great talk. So thanks for spending the time with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate the opportunity. And uh, if anybody you know has any questions or wants to connect, please feel free to share my email. Will do. Thanks. Bye.